everyone, welcome to Christ Community Church. My name's Emily and we are really glad that you're here today. We still have a few minutes before service begins, so here's what you need to know this week at CCC. Join us this Christmas Eve as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. A powerful message of hope will be presented at our family-friendly services. We'll have five identical Christmas services around the theme of celebrating Christmas together. Our Christmas services will start on Monday, December 23rd at 4 and 6 p.m. and Tuesday, December 24th at 2, 4 and 6 p.m. Check out Christmas at CCC.com for more information and use that link to invite your friends, neighbors, and coworkers to join you. Join us the Sunday after Christmas as we participate in Question Mark, a special service where you get to ask our lead minister, Mark Ashton, any question you want. It's easy to come off the holidays and walk into the new year feeling like your soul is gunked up with consumerism, debt, and maybe too much time with extended family. January is the best time of year to do a soul detox, to connect with God more deeply, to learn to love Him more deeply, and to clean out the junk that's been in the closet of our soul. Join us January 5th for the start of our new series, Detox. Christian leaders, you're invited to join hundreds of other leaders from across the Omaha Metro for a one-day seminar on city reaching with special guest Carrie Newhoff on Thursday, January 16th. Carrie is the founding pastor of Connexus Church in Barrie, Ontario, one of the most influential churches in North America. He consults with leaders all over the world on overcoming growth barriers. Church leaders and pastors will be developed in their new leadership, hear stories of what God's doing in our city, and learn from one of the great minds in city reaching today. Service is about to begin. Once again, thanks for being here this morning. For more details on anything that we've talked about, check out this week's program or go online.
It's fun here in the month of December to sing some Christmas songs with you guys. And uh, of course, we're glad you're here this morning. My name is Ryan, and I'm one of the worship leaders here. Our prayer each and every week is that you connect with God in a way that changes you as you leave this morning. And so we're excited about the plan. Uh, we're anticipating the work that God is going to do through the worship time, through opening his word together, and simply being together and serving one another. And so we're excited about today. If you're new, we want to extend a special welcome to you. And uh, we hope you feel like family here, even if it's your first time. And uh, if you want some more information, you can head out to the atrium after service and check out the Next Steps booth. Um, and they should be able to help you there with any questions you have. We're going to continue uh, by worshiping God, but before we do that, take just a moment, maybe find someone around you, maybe someone you haven't met. If you're feeling bold, tell them a little, welcome them. We'll continue singing in just a moment. your voices with us.
Thank you for this time of worship together, the truth that we're privileged to sing. Thank you for these wonderful voices in our congregation lifting praises to you. And we love you. You are worthy of our worship. We proclaim that and acknowledge that. And so we worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. We pray in your name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. And good morning and Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. But when the fullness of time had come, God so loved this world that he sent forth and gave us his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, 
but have everlasting life. And then Mary gave birth to her firstborn son. Her son Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and I count myself among those he sought and saved, and then later commanded to take a few moments to remember the cost, the cost of his life. The broken body and the shed blood of the firstborn son whose birth we celebrate this season. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. The communion ordinance is the hardening agent of our present faith and the celebration of hope, that confident expectation of eternal life when Jesus Christ returns. At Christ Community Church, we celebrate what we call open communion, which means if you're a follower of Jesus, regardless of your denominational affiliation, we welcome you to celebrate with us this morning. The ushers, please come forward. The ushers will pass out the elements in two cups. Please take both and then hold them in this time of contemplation and we'll celebrate together after the music.
The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now the Apostle Paul did not leave us in the past or the present, but he says, for whenever you eat this bread and whenever you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. I say, come Lord Jesus, come. In benediction, as I close this morning, now to him, our God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen.
you pray with me? Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for your willingness to see in us something special, something unique, something so amazing that you were willing to send your son as a little baby to this earth, knowing what his outcome and what his life would ultimately end. It's the greatest gift. And for that, we humbly thank you. We give you all of the glory. And I pray, Lord, right now, that you'll start to prepare our hearts, open up our spirit to hear your word fresh and new, just like the gentle falling snow that is covering the ground right now. May we just find rest and peace in your presence. May we be wrapped in your love and feel the warmth of your spirit moving through us as you speak to us in a mighty way. We thank you for all you pour out in our lives, the smallest joys to the biggest blessings. And it's with that we praise you. And in your mighty name, we all said, Amen. You may have a seat. Awesome. What a great time of worship together. Uh, can we just thank our worship team for uh, leading us before God musically? And I, okay, I echo that prayer. Jesus is the very best gift that God has given to us. And it's this season, it's good to be reminded of that. And uh, in that same heart, we want to thank you for your faithful generosity. Those of you who came prepared uh, with a gift, I know many of you give financially here, and we uh, just want to thank you. If you came with something uh, like cash or check, we've got some boxes that you can drop those into on your way out. Many of you also commit to give online faithfully. We couldn't do this ministry. We couldn't have Sunday morning services. We couldn't uh, extend the kingdom of God here in our city and throughout the world without your faithful generosity. So, uh, and we do that not because of something that we're coerced to do, but it's really an overflow of what God has already done in us. Amen. So we thank you very much. Well, I want to welcome you and say Merry Christmas. We're like one week out from uh, the Christmas uh, celebration. Uh, we've got some great services happening uh, next week on Monday and Tuesday, Christmas Eve. Eve and Christmas Eve, five services in all. And I want to give you every tool possible so that you can prepare. Last week, we gave some time in our service to write out some handwritten postcard invitations. And many of you did that and dropped those in our little post boxes. And we had hundreds of go out. And we're hoping that a few more will, will uh, go out in the mail. And you can invite your friends that way. We still have some postcards for you if you want to grab them and get them in the mail yet this week. But we also want to give you a way to invite, uh, in maybe a little simpler way, a, a digital format. So... Uh, on our website, if you take your phone out, you can actually snap a picture of that with your phone's uh, camera app, and it'll direct you to our website, Christmas at ccc.org, or you can just go to the link if you'd rather go that way. And uh, we've got some digital resources on there for you to use, uh, some shareable buttons. We, we're hoping that God is laying people in your minds, on your hearts of who's been in your life this year for you to be able to say, you know what, I would really want to reach out to this person and invite them to come with me to one of our services. They're going to be great if you've never been to one before. Uh, they're really, really just a great uh, reminder of who Jesus is and uh, gets our hearts centered around the right season. And we want to see every seat filled, every seat filled, and you're a big part of making that happen. So we encourage you to invite, share on social media, text your friends, and uh, make the calls, and let's get this place uh, filled with people who can encounter Jesus this Christmas season. Amen. And uh, we don't want to just fill the place. We want to create a right environment when people are coming. And so we're trying something new this year called uh, a one-serve opportunity at Christmas Eve. Maybe you, your journey group, you and your family would say, hey, I can give a service to help uh, be on our greeting team that day. And uh, we would love to just uh, let you know about the opportunity. And the simplest way to do that is to send us a text to, see, um, to 474747 and in 
in the text message itself, write CCC serve. So text the word CCC serve to 474747. You'll get an immediate response back, which will uh, link you to uh, a simple form to fill out to let us know when you're available. And uh, we'll be in touch with you then. We're hoping for, you know, uh, a couple, uh, maybe 50, 60 more people to help us greet and uh, make the environment great for our Christmas Eve services. Next week, too, I want to mention it's our last uh, weekend of longings. We're having church here Sunday morning. And uh, I don't know, were any of you guys like choir people like growing up in high school or maybe you sang in a church choir? Am I the only one? Am I the only one? <laughs> you got, got some hands waved. Well, next week, uh, our uh, director of music, Steve Yost, is going to be leading music in here. We're going to have some, the stage cleared and be ready for Christmas Eve. And he's going to do something fun. He's going to actually invite some of you, whoever wants to, to come up and sing the Hallelujah Chorus. It's something that I did back in high school. And uh, the, the, the invitation's open to you. You can think about it. You can download the music on YouTube. You can, you can practice if you want to, but it will be a fun time for us. Uh, well, we're going to jump in to um, our message with Pastor Mark in just a moment. Uh, but we also have an encouraging story that we want to share with you. We've been in a two-year vision uh, initiative called Beyond Belief. And this is a great story about a young couple in our family who's decided not only to give, but to finish strong. So check this out. I'm Travis Williams. I've been at Christ Community Church for eight years now, and I am the Director of Technical Arts at the church. And I am Jenny Williams, and I've been going to Christ Community for 16 years, and uh, I'm married to this guy, and we have two children together, um, Rowan, who is four, and Ruby, who is one and a half. When the, the time for Beyond Belief came around, I think we had just found out we were pregnant with Ruby. Very, very recently, yes. Financially speaking, things were, you know, we're a one income family. I stay home with the kids because that's a priority to us. And so um, just the idea of giving more than what we already were giving was a little intimidating to me. We pulled out the spreadsheet of our, of our monthly budget and we were, said we know we want to give more than the tithe. So let's figure out are there categories we can move some dollars out of here to put towards giving to the church to, for Beyond Belief. Looked at a couple of things around the house that we said we could sell that we either don't use or um, God just put it on my heart to sell one of my guitars and give money from that to Beyond Belief. So we just started looking at those things and trying to figure out what can we what can we do? What is our commitment really going to be? I th yeah, I think because for our for our situation, it was like there's not a whole lot of room to give more on a monthly basis. We just don't we just didn't have a lot of room to stretch, and so it was really a matter of thinking about like. What can we anticipate maybe extra income coming in for our tax return or yeah. holidays or maybe a side job or something? And so, you know, trying to anticipate like how much can we expect to be able to give out of that? After we made the commitment, like we had no idea what the next two years was going to hold in store for us, but it was very unexpected. Our daughter was born early. Um, and ended up needing to be in the hospital for a week at Children's. I remember very specifically like just feeling overwhelmed because um, even after insurance, the bill that we got was pretty high. It was over $10,000. Yeah, and so um, we figured we wouldn't qualify for much, but we decided to apply for financial aid from the hospital. And I will never forget coming home after visiting my family for Christmas, and there was a letter in the mail and I opened it and the hospital said, you owe nothing. They covered the entire bill for yep. her birth. I just truly felt like God was saying, see, I'm taking care of you. Like, you yep. don't need to worry about this stuff. A couple months after that, my truck breaks down and needs a few thousand dollars of repairs to which I say, yeah, the truck's not worth that much. I'm not gonna pay that much to fix it. Unexpectedly, a friend of ours offered us the full amount we were asking for, for the truck, and then sold him the truck, and then just a couple of days, of days later, found someone selling a used car for almost the same amount that we sold the truck for. Here we are thinking, okay, we're gonna have to make some major life adjustments with having one car now, and then God provides the money and the vehicle for us. I mean, in, in less than a week of my truck breaking down, we were able to get it replaced. Mm -hmm. All through the 
past couple of years as we've been giving to Beyond Belief. We've been giving the extra that we wanted to give even when these financial things have come up. So it's, it's been interesting. Every time that we, it seems like every time we give a little more than maybe we originally thought we might, that God provides a little more for whatever thing comes up. It just felt like overwhelming in some ways that he just kept time and time again mm -hmm. showing up like that. Yeah, we were actually, we were looking at our commitment and our finances just last night, mm -hmm. thinking about, okay, we've got another month of giving left for Beyond Belief. and. We got the little uh, update in the mail from the church, and we looked at it and we were like, oh no, are, are we gonna be able to make the goal? What's, what's gonna happen here? Are we gonna be able to meet our original commitment? Up to the last minute, he's providing the, the yeah. dollars that we needed to, to meet the commitment he put on our hearts. I think that finishing strong is partially just about trusting God He's going to take that money and he's going to do a lot more than just build a new building or buy some Bibles or, you know, build a playground for some kids. Like he's going to impact people's hearts and their lives for eternity. And that is something that really matters. And so I think, you know, that's just my encouragement is to keep that in mind as you finish out the year. Let's give it up for Jenny and Travis. Come on. It's not easy to be able to tell your story uh, related to uh, what your giving journey has been. So I am thankful for Jenny and Travis and for their incredible willingness to do that. And they're just a great example of two years ago when we began talking about Beyond Belief. I told all of you guys that, you know, we're going to be on this adventure together. But it's not just about the impact that's going to happen outside of you because of your giving. It's about the impact of what God's going to do in your life as you grow in faith, as you take risks, as you watch God provide. And these guys are a great example of that. And it's also a reminder that we're coming up to the finish line of Beyond Belief. December 31st is our uh, finish line date for that. And uh, as we move towards that point, I just want to remind you of two key factors that I think are going to be the two things that will uh, help us to get across the finish line with success. Number one is 100% engagement. That means everybody who was here two years ago, everybody who's come to Christ Community Church since then is prayerful and saying, God, what do you want to do through me at my income level with my resources to be able to finish this strong? So 100% engagement. And the second thing is people being faithful to their commitment. Uh, if you said this is the amount that I'm going to give and we're coming up to the finish line, if everybody's faithful to their commitment and 100% of people are engaged in listening to God, I'm convinced that the $2.4 million that we need in December will be fully provided for by God and we'll be able to finish this deal exactly as God intended us to do that. Amen? All right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and roll that uh, together. You know, in just uh, this week, we're going to be talking uh, during our message today about the longing for peace. Okay, that's our, our subject for today uh, on our subject of longings. We're going to be talking about longing for peace. And just this week, in addition to my normal job, there were a number of things that got in the way of uh, my work life. My dad was in town Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday this week. There were four hospital episodes that happened with people that I know and love, two funerals this week, and a visit to prison. Besides that, I was sick, and so my sermon prep just kept on getting pushed back later and later into the week, until Friday, and then until Saturday, and yesterday, in a flurry, in a high amount of stress, I was writing my message about how to experience perfect peace. <laughs> I just want to confess before I start, I need this as much as anybody who is here in this room, I'm living this out along with you. Because Nebraskans today might describe their experience as stress on steroids. I mean, you consider in the news senseless shootings, uh, nasty political climate, rivers flooding, increasing suicide rates. Then there's stressors at home like caring for an aging parent or parenting a disabled child or managing your own conditions or addictions, looking for a job, moving, living with divorce. Then you add on to that daily annoyances that come into your life. Traffic jams, snow on Sundays, <laughs> a diaper blowout, <laughs> or getting your finger caught in the car door. 
and you add that stress on top of stress, it's no wonder we're about to pop as a culture. Did you know that this is more prevalent in younger people than it ever has been in the past in older people? Uh, boomers today, 41% of boomers would say that they have had a mental health episode during their lifetime. 41% of people 60 plus. But among Gen Z, those people who are teenagers and early 20s today, 52% would say they've had a mental health episode already in their life. It seems like teenagers, especially teenage girls, are experiencing anxiety and stress at unprecedented levels in the past. And it makes me wonder, why is this the case? Why are teenagers so stressed out? And I thought I could do the research and tell you from my perspective as a Gen Xer why I think teenagers are stressed out. But then I thought we could have a teenager tell you. And then I thought, I have a teenager at home who might be able to give us some reflections on teenage stress. So she's joined us here today. This is my daughter, 16-year-old Haven Ashton. Can you give it up for her? Hi, everyone. My name is Haven, and I am stressed. I'm a good student. I participate in speech competitions called forensics. I'm committed to our student ministry here, and I volunteer here at least weekly plus babysitting and friends. Adults often attribute the stress that we experience to social media. And while that may be a factor, I can tell you the big factor that my friends think it is. School. I am in school eight hours a day, and then I have hours upon hours of homework every single night. It would be like an adult working 12 to 13 hour shifts five days a week. And some days, the homework all hits on the same night. Like teachers don't understand that we have other classes that are giving us homework too. Sometimes this homework becomes so too much so that, and along with other stresses in people's lives, that some of my friends will cry themselves to sleep every single night. The truth is, I enjoy forensics. So I do my best to compete well. So this means an extra hour of class every day plus practicing at home, plus competitions on the weekend. Last Friday, I was at a forensic competition until 11.30 p.m. My friends are the same. Some do sports for three hours a day, some have marching band practice at 6.30 a.m., some put on amazing plays at school, but the busiest are the show choir kids. <laughs> Don't even get me started. This crazy level of busyness actually drives the second major stressor of teens today, sleep deprivation. Teens are chronically sleep deprived. This is primarily due to biology. Teens are different than other ages in that the teenage brain releases the chemical melatonin at 11 p.m., two hours later than any other age group. So waking your teen up at 6 a.m. is the functional equivalent of waking an adult up at 4 a.m. Adults, I don't know what your day is like at 4 a.m., but I can imagine that you are tired, moody, and irritable, just like my dad. <laughs> so many of the characteristics that are chalked up to being a teenager can actually be chalked up to sleep deprivation. Wendy Troxell, a sleep researcher with Rand Corporation, says that adolescence is a period of dramatic brain development. So the things that are developing in our brains are good judgment and reasoning. In other words, the things that keep you from doing bad things are still developing in us. Because of this, I and my peers need eight to 10 hours of sleep per night. And before you start patting yourself on the back that your teen is getting eight hours of sleep, remember, that is a minimum. You get a C on your report card. It's no wonder that my friends and I are walking around school like zombies at 8 a.m. Many of them cope with this with high doses of, of caffeine. They actually want to do well in school, so a venti latte or an energy drink helps them get through all of their classes. You could classify teens as both super tired and highly wired. Then 
put them in an atmosphere where their job is to listen to seven or eight 45 minute lectures each day with a six minute break in between to pee, get to the next class, and start all over again. You can imagine why stress is an issue. But let's just add in a few more stressors that affect some teens. Some of my friends have parents that ignore them. Some of them have parents that are getting divorced. Some bounce between parents' houses. Some have violent or abusive parents. Some are sexually active. Some are sexually confused. Some are not doing well in school. Some are seeing psychiatrists. Some have medical issues. Some are taking care of younger siblings while both parents work. Some are trying drugs. Some are dealing drugs. Some are working 20 hours a week to help make ends meet. Stress on top of stress. Teens have real stress. Trust me, we need people who will understand, who will listen, and who will love us when we are cranky, tired, or irritable. We also need models of people who live in real peace because it's something that we long for too. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, did you not just add stress to your daughter's life by making her do a speech in front of a thousand people? <laughs> you know, whether you're a kid or an adult or a senior, the truth of the matter is that all of us are longing for peace. It, it seems to be something that people yearn for on a very deep basis. As we try and figure out life, we've become big managers of stress. Now, I hope you guys don't mind. I'm going to... Uh, put on this backpack and wear it uh, for the rest of the message here because uh, uh, it, uh, it helps my posture uh, as I stand and I decided to put some books in the back, big books. I got my biggest Bible is in the back and a Bible dictionary and a uh, dictionary of theology uh, so that I can feel a little more holy and have access to them if I need them in the middle of the message and just to prove to you all that I own those kinds of books. I thought that might be a helpful thing from a pastor. Anyway, the truth of the matter is all of us need to experience peace. It's one of the biggest felt needs that we have in our culture, the need to feel peace. And during this Christmas time, you would think that we would want to experience that even more. Holiday stress tends to go up in our, in, or during the holiday, stress goes up in our lives. And the truth is that we celebrate a time where we celebrate peace. In fact, why don't you help me fill in the blank on this commonly known Christmas verse. This is Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, which says, For to us a child is born, for to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and... Prince of Peace. Yeah, he's going to be the Prince of Peace. And so at this time, we celebrate the Prince of Peace by going through massive amounts of stress. Is it possible? Is it possible for us to be able to live in perfect peace? Isaiah says that it is. He says about God that he will keep you in perfect peace, or he will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. So here's what we're going to approach today. How do you experience this idea of perfect peace by trusting in Jesus. In fact, I want to postulate that the critical uh, factor in whether or not we experience peace in our lives has nothing to do with the pace of life or the principles we follow or the practices we have or how much yoga or deep breathing that we do. But instead, it's all about a person. It's about who we connect to. That the very nature of experiencing peace has everything to do with a who, and that is the Prince of Peace, Jesus himself. And I want to talk about experiencing peace on three different levels, because the Bible talks about experiencing peace on three different levels as well. And the first one of those levels is ontological peace. Ontological peace, or that is peace that is real. Now, some of you go, man, that's a big philosophy word you're dropping on us here. What does ontological mean? Well, ontological is a metaphysical term that talks about the study of existence or of being. Ontology is the study of being. 
It's about the things that are really real, more fundamentally real than other things. That while we're experiencing these things on the surface, there are things that are more deeply and profoundly real. The study of being, that is ontology. And so I would contend that there is a kind of peace that's more real, more deep, more profound than the whirling nature of what's happening in our world today. And that ontological peace is the idea that we can have peace with God, with the God of the universe, with our creator. We can be good with the one who designed us to be in a relationship with him. In fact, one of the main messages of the Bible is that the Prince of Peace came in order to stop the war that people were waging against God and create an opportunity of peace between people and God. Now, I've said this to people in the past, and oftentimes what they say is, I don't feel like I'm waging war against God. I mean, I might be ignoring him. I might think he's irrelevant. I might disagree with him. I'm not waging war against him. But think about it. When God designed this world, he designed it to operate in a certain way. And every time we violate his provision, so every time we hurt another human being, every time we lie or cheat or gossip or power up or are greedy, every time we hurt the planet that God designed us to live on, every time that we do something that would be offensive to God himself, any one of those three levels is like waging little mini wars against God. And then you add that up with billions of people over thousands of years all around the planet, and pretty soon you have an all-out humanity war against the God of the universe. And because of this, it's created a rift between us and God because we're wrecking all of the beautiful things that he created. But God loves us so much that he says, I want to do something about that. I will send my son, the Prince of Peace, to planet Earth in order to create peace between God and man. Now the problem is that all of this war that we've created, the only penalty that makes sense for that level of war against God is the penalty of bloodshed. It's the penalty of death. And Jesus said, I'll stop at nothing. I will even pay that penalty the penalty of death, the penalty of a violent death on a Roman cross, I would pay even that in order to make peace between God and people. And because he was able to make the payment that's necessary to reconcile people to God, he was in the place to bargain for peace between God and human beings, to forgive us of our sins, to forgive us of our warring actions against God, so that we can, have ex- we can experience forgiveness and eternal life forever. We can have peace with God, and this is good news, amen? That is ontological peace, or the peace that is real. And Jesus offers us that peace, that peace that surpasses all understanding, that peace that's there on the deeper level. No matter how life is whirling on this level, you still have peace with God that's going to last for all eternity. And that's ontological peace. On the second level, we have experiential peace. And that's peace that you can feel. So someone say peace that is real. real. Now say peace you can feel. Oh, do you feel a pastoral rhyme coming on here? Can you guys sense we got point number three with another rhyming word that's coming up? That's, that's when church is really good, when everything rhymes. <laughs> peace that is real and then peace you can feel. So experiential peace says, okay, super glad that I have peace with God on an ontological level. Now the question is, how do I experience that peace on a day-to-day basis by downloading God's principles into my life so that I can feel the same way that ontological reality is. So that there's no gap between those things. And I'm convinced that one of the best verses that helps us to move to a life of experiential peace came from Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 11. It's this verse right here. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. First of all, I want you to notice that right off at the top, there's an invitation that comes in where Jesus says, come to me. It reinforces our main idea that peace is not about a principle or a practice. Peace is about a person. (laughs) Jesus says, you want to experience rest? Oh, well, come to me. You're somebody who's weary and burdened. Is life getting you down? 
Are you moving faster than you know how to move? Are there external circumstances that are getting in your way? Well, come to me and I will give you what? I will give you, I'll give you rest. And doesn't that sound good? To be able to go to Jesus and there find rest. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now pause right there for a minute. Because in the ancient world, the idea of a yoke could be found in two primary places. The first place would be on, uh, uh, on the neck of an animal, an animal that was dragging a cart, usually an oxen or something similar. And that wooden piece that they would strap over the animal and tie the ropes to, that was called the yoke. And the best kinds of yokes were custom designed for that exact animal so that it fit on their neck correctly, so that when they pulled, when they pulled hard, it didn't chafe against their shoulders. So there were yokes that were easy yokes and yokes that were hard yokes. Some made the work happen easily, some made it happen hard. Similarly, when people carried water, uh, there was a, 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 a tool called a yoke that would help usually a woman, because women did most of the water carrying. Instead of carrying one uh, bucket of water on her head, she would be able to carry two buckets of water with it strapped across her shoulders and then uh, ropes that go down. And what was strapped across her shoulders was a wooden device that was called a yoke. And there were yokes that were painful to wear, and there were yokes that were custom-fitted and well-designed and felt good on the shoulders. And when you had a good yoke, it made it way easier to do the work that you had to do every single day. And so what Jesus is saying is he's saying, take my yoke upon you, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now notice that Jesus ties the idea of a yoke into learning. Take my yoke upon you and Learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. Where does that come from? Well, in rabbinic teaching during the first century, rabbis would oftentimes tie together the idea of a yoke with being connected to the Torah. So you were yoked to the Old Testament law. The thing that you were tied to, the thing that you were burdened with, was the law. And the law was 613 commands that you could add up from the Old Testament. And not only was it those 613 commands, but the rabbis prided themselves on being able to layer interpretive commands on top of the commands that were already there so that you would know what the commands would really mean. And this would become a huge burden for somebody to carry. There were interpretive things like, well, what does it mean to honor the Sabbath day? And they would ask the question, are you allowed to light a fire to cook your food or not? Is that work or is it not? How many sticks are you allowed to collect on the Sabbath day? How many steps are you allowed to take? And so they would have these interpretive rules that would create a huge burden in people's lives. And Jesus said, look, look, look. I want you guys to take my yoke upon you. If a yoke is a set of teachings, and what people were carrying in that day was 613 teachings plus interpretation, Jesus says, I got a yoke that's way easier for you. How about two? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of the other law and the prophets hang on these two. So instead of, instead of spending all of your time on the details of moralism, instead of trying to earn your way up to God's expectations by living life exactly right, how about if you just live this way? Trust in me, and then love God, and love people. If you get those things right, all of the other moral questions and dilemmas that you run into will become that much easier. You know, probably if you were to look for a modern day uh, equivalent of what a yoke would be, a good parallel would be a backpack. A backpack. And Jesus essentially says, hey, trade in that heavy burdened backpack to me because you know that whole thing is really kind of irrelevant and unnecessary and unhelpful. And the excuses that you make for wearing it are really not that good. Instead, plus it annoys everybody in the audience when you're wearing it for like 10 minutes during your message. But instead, trade that one in, and I got one that fits a lot better. Instead of being yoked to the old way, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What does this look like in God's category? Well, you need to know that it looks like this. 
that there is nothing that you can do in your life to make God love you more. And there is nothing that you can do to make God love you less. That's a truth that you can take to the bank. And this is important because in the rest of our lives, we have performance expectations that will drive the love or approval of the people you're around. From the time you're a little kid, you're taught to behave a certain way, and mom and dad give you treats or punishments based on the way that you are, uh, the way that you perform. In school, you have expectations. In work, you have expectations. And what Jesus is saying is, my world <coughs> is not a world of burden and expectation. My world is a world of rest. And you can take that to the bank because there is nothing you can do that will make God love you more. And... There is nothing that you can do that will make God love you less. Some people live in cycles of guilt because they screwed up this week or last year or 20 years ago. And they think that because of that screw up, there is in some way I've gone lower on the spiritual spectrum, lower on the love level from God. But that's not the way that God works. God gives away his forgiveness freely to all of us so that all of us who are major screw-ups can come before him and know that he does not love us any less. And this is good news. Amen? We have a God who loves us unconditionally. He says, take off your backpack and put on my yoke, my easy yoke. Now, I got to tell you, when I was in college and I heard this idea that the yoke of Jesus is easy and his burden is light, I didn't buy it very much. Because I realized that there were certain behavioral constraints that were expected of me if I was going to say I'm a follower of Jesus. For example, I wasn't uh, allowed to uh, get drunk, or I wasn't supposed to make it with my girlfriend, or I wasn't supposed to power up on people and use language that cut people down. God says that, uh, God says that when you take on my yoke, sometimes... Short-term discipline helps you to experience long-term peace, long-term rest, long-term benefits. I think of all of the pain that I avoided by living life for Jesus early in my life. All the things that could have happened that didn't happen because I made the right choices with the yoke of Jesus. That in the long run, my burden has been so much lighter. It's the addiction that I or you never had to battle. It's the affair that you never had, the STD that you never got, the pain you never caused, the words that you don't regret you said, the marriage that's still together, the car wreck that didn't take place, the ego that wasn't bruised, the feelings that were never hurt. That's an easy yoke. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So Jesus says, you want peace? Live according to my principles, experiential peace. It's peace that you can feel when you take Jesus' yoke upon you. Now, I want to make sure that I don't overstate what this promise is from Jesus. Because Jesus does say, if you control the circumstances that are controllable in your life, in the long run, your your life is going to be easier. There will be peace you can feel. But what it doesn't mean is that, what peace doesn't mean is that those external factors that are outside of your control are going to be easy from this point forward. In fact, Jesus said it very clearly in John chapter 16. He says, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you'll have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Can you believe those two sentences are right next to each other in Jesus' vocabulary? I've come that you might have peace, but in this world you will have trouble. What Jesus is saying is, don't equivocate my peace with the absence of conflict or pain in this world. Because the truth of the matter is, your brother may be unjustly accused and sent to jail. Your parents may get divorced. Your grandchild may have a medical issue that's outside of your control. Things happen outside of our control because we live in a sin-stained, out-of-control world that's at war with God. And just because we trust in Jesus doesn't mean that we're going to become immune to those things. What Jesus says instead is, here's how you have peace. In this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world. 
And it's not the peace that you experience through circumstances. It's the peace that you experience in coming to me that allows you to have that peace you can feel even in the middle of the storm. He invites us into his perfect peace through knowing him and through his power to overcome everything in the world. Which points us to principle number three, which is ultimate peace. Ultimate peace. So we have ontological peace. That's peace that is real. Experiential peace. That's peace you can feel. And we have ultimate peace. And I need a rhyming word to go with that. So I thought about cornmeal, cartwheel, square deal, (laughs) conceal, newsreel. But what did I come up with? Peace that's ideal. Someone say, that's good. That's good. That's good. Everyone read, peace that's ideal. Peace that's ideal. You see, the peace that we experience in this world is a peace in the midst of the storm, but it's not the ultimate perfect peace that God really intends for us into the future. There's this mysterious verse that talks about that. It's kind of an oxymoron verse. In uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 20, it says this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Isn't that interesting that the God of peace is about to do something violent. He's going to crush Satan under your feet. And after he talks about this idea of peace and violence in the same sentence, he says the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. But this is brilliantly the case. Because the one who is the one who drives stress and turmoil in our lives every single day is the evil one. He's the enemy of our soul. He's the master of lies. He's the one who brings about deception into this world. And until his role is eliminated, there will always be conflict and turmoil in this world. But there is going to come a day when Jesus is going to come back again and he is going to have the ultimate victory over sin and over Satan that allows him or that moves him into non-existence in this world anymore and no point of influence, he will be crushed under your feet and this is good news, amen? Amen. And when that happens, our experience of peace will be that perfect peace. I think of somebody uh, who I love uh, this week. Her name is Dorothy Alford. And Dorothy and Bill Alford have been at Christ Community Church for probably 50 plus years and have been people of influence here. Dorothy passed away this week, but I think about the legacy that Dorothy and Bill have brought us. They were some of the very first people to walk this property and say that we should move the church from its location downtown right here to what was the western edge of the city at that time. They were some of the very first ones to say that they would invest in this room, in this building, and the next addition, and the next addition, and the next addition. And it's because of them, largely because of them, that people said yes and jumped on board. It's because of their leadership that we have the student center right across the parking lot. It's because of Dorothy's leadership in particular that Parable's bookstore came into existence. She is the tour de force and the longtime manager of the Parable's bookstore. And if you have ever experienced that, been blessed by that, gotten a book from there, you have Dorothy to thank for that. Dorothy went home to go and be with Jesus. And as she's home with Jesus, she is experiencing ideal peace. A place where there's no more tears, no more crying, No more pain, no more evil, no more difficulties. A place where God's love is real and palpable and his peace is felt. And one way or another, it's the destiny of everybody who believes in Jesus. Either we will pass from this world and move on to perfect peace, peace that's ideal, or we'll be here when Jesus comes back again and crushes Satan, and at that point we will experience this peace that's ideal. But one way or another, that is the direction that we are headed this Christmas. That's the peace where we are headed for. And so there will come a day when you will have that ultimate peace, that peace that's ideal. And in all of its fullness, this prophecy from Isaiah, you will keep in perfect peace those minds who are steadfast, because they trust in you, that will come true in its most ideal sense. So I wanna roll through this one more time, point by point, with each of the three factors. 
And as I do that, I want to do it through the lens of past, present, and future. Because the ontological piece, the piece that is real, has happened already. It happened in the past, in the cross of Jesus. But it doesn't happen automatically for everybody. The peace that is real takes place for people who have put their trust in Jesus, who have overtly said yes to Jesus. Yes, I will follow you. This morning, uh, I was awakened with a dream that was vivid in my mind when I popped out of bed. It was a really short dream. It was a one-sentence dream. It was a guy who came up to me and he said, this is my last chance. Just those short five words. This is my last chance. And I said, oh God, what do you want to communicate to me through that? I got a really clear sense from him that he was saying, there are going to be people who are in church on Sunday morning where this is their last chance to say yes to me. There's going to be people who are watching online who it may be their last chance to say yes to me. I don't know what that means. I don't know if it may be the case that somebody who's alive today, who's here, will not be alive next Sunday morning. Or if it means that there's somebody here who's saying, you know what, I'm giving my last opportunity, I'm giving God my last opportunity before I never come to church again and write the whole thing off. Friends, if that's you, if you're in that category, if you're somebody who says, I've been putting this off for a long time and this may be my last chance to say yes to trust in Jesus, I just want to say, make today your day. Say yes to Jesus. You can have peace with God, peace that starts now, and peace that lasts for all eternity. And I so want that for you. So I'm going to be giving you a little bit of time of silent, peaceful prayer in a couple of moments. And for some of you, that's what you need to pray. You need to say, God, I trust in you. I trust in Jesus' death on the cross. I trust that you made peace, and I want it for myself. Some of you may be in the next category, the category of the present, where you say, you know what, I've made my peace with God. I know that I am saved and I've been reconciled to God, but my life is still spinning way too fast. And there are some circumstances that are going on in my life that I just need the real sense of God's presence in my life and for the peace of God that transcends all understanding to fill my heart and my mind. Some of you may say, I've been carrying around a backpack that's way too big. I've been trying to live up to expectations of God and not just live into the love of God. And I need to take this backpack off and instead take Jesus' yoke upon me, one that's burden is easy, that his way is light. And I just need to start living in trust with a person who asked me to love God and love people. Maybe that's your decision today. Or maybe you're someone who's saying, you know what, I have very real peace. I live in that peace every single day. My life is not in turmoil. I have peace that you can feel, but I am looking forward to that peace that's ideal. That one day it comes in all of its fullness when Jesus comes back again, trounces evil, and makes everything right. And during the prayer time, you just need to say, thank you, Jesus, for coming the first time. And I can't wait until you come the next time. But whatever your prayer is today, I wanted to give you a moment of peace before the message was over to be able to listen to God and to pray the prayer that you need to pray right now. Whether it's for that real peace, the peace you can feel, or the peace that's ideal, why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes right now. I'm going to have Ryan play in the background, and you just do whatever business you need to do with God at this point. Pray the prayers that need to be prayed. Meet with him in this moment.
Now, my friends, I'm going to go ahead and pray a couple of prayers, three prayers, actually. And each one reflects the different kinds of peace that we've talked about. Peace that's real, peace you can feel, peace that's ideal. And as you've done business with God, you may have prayed similar prayers to this. What I want to do is give you an opportunity to just affirm those out loud. So I'll pray a prayer over you, and if that's a prayer that you prayed at the end, I'll invite you to say, that's me. And if it's you, you just say, that's me, and uh, God will hear your prayer. You can say, that's me, to one or two or all three. It doesn't matter that much. It's just, if that's a sincere reflection of your heart, that you would mark the moment by saying, that's you. That's who this is all about. So, Father, I want to pray over my first category of people, people who have said yes to you for today. People who have said, yes, I believe in Jesus. People who have said, yes, I want that to be a reality in my life. Yes, I want to trust in Jesus for my eternal life. I don't want to be at war with God, but I want to have peace through the Prince of Peace that shed his blood on my behalf. And I trust that for myself today. And if that's your prayer today, if that's something that you believe and you say, I want to affirm that today, I'm going to invite you to say, that's me, on the count of three. One, two, three. That's me. Maybe you're in that middle category of someone who's got things that are going on in your life where you need to experience God's perfect peace. And Father, I want to pray over these brothers and sisters that the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That they would take the yoke of Jesus upon themselves. That they wouldn't stress them out, themselves out with divine expectations, but instead would rest in you, loving God and loving people. And if that's where you're at today, you can affirm that by saying, that's me. Here we go. One, two, three. That's me. And then finally, Lord, there are people who are saying, I live with this perfect peace every day, but we can't wait for you to come back. <laughs> we can't wait for your uh, final triumphant return, for you to crush the head of Satan underneath our feet we're grateful that we can count on that as a promise, and I am looking forward to the peace that's ideal. And if that's your prayer today, you can say, that's me. Ready? One, two, three. That's me. God, we're grateful that we can live with peace. We're grateful that we have Jesus. We're grateful that we have the power of the cross. And now to the one who's given us peace, to the Prince of Peace, Jesus himself, be all glory, honor, and power. May your kingdom come and your will be done. May your peace spread first in our hearts, then in our homes, and then to the entirety of our city and our state and our world. And we invite you to do this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you next week. Thanks again for joining us at our online services. If you're in the Omaha area and you're not already connected to CCC, we'd love to have the opportunity to meet with you. A great way to do that is to visit cccomaha.org slash next steps.